one of the things that we have done so far is we've been all the way through the Old Testament with the exception of Psalms, and we're going to come back to that later on. Now we're going to start the New Testament, um, and people say, well, what about the prophets? Well, we're going to handle the prophets a little bit differently in that we're going to look at uh, the Old Testament um, through the eyes of fulfilling those prophecies um, and who fulfilled those prophecies, Jesus. So today we're going to begin our series on the Old Testament prophecies um, and and kind of things that happened hundreds, even thousands of years before they actually happened. So they were prophesied many, many years before they happened. And we're going to look at four themes. Uh, we'll look at the focus of our series. Um, we'll take a look at the likelihood of it happening the way it did. We'll take a look at the Old Testament appearance of Jesus, which are different than the prophecies, but actually very important. And then finally, we'll take a look at the actual story of Jesus. So let's begin with the, the, the focus of our series. Um, and, and as we begin, it's important to note that there are some who absolutely do not believe that Jesus fulfilled prophecy at all. And for example, there's a controversy regarding several key scriptures. And it's important for you to know this because as you talk to people in the community, they may bring this up, but there is a controversy between scriptures in Isaiah 2 and Isaiah 11 and Micah 4. Now, now Jack, can you read Isaiah 11 verses 6 through 10? I'll tell you what I'm talking about. Okay, uh, but you didn't give me that one, so it'll take just a second. Oh, see? Uh, <laughs> anyway, this 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 verse, these verses cover prophecy about the coming Messiah, and, and and those are prophecies that haven't been fulfilled yet. And and Jonathan Burnus, president and CEO of the Jewish Voice, uh, noted some things in an article. But I'll let Jack read that verse first. Okay, this is Isaiah eleven six through. Did I get that right? Six, yeah, three, six or ten. Eleven. Okay. Isaiah eleven six or ten. The wolf will live with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with the goat. All right, hold on, Jack. So one of the criticisms is we don't see wolves lying down with lambs or nursing children playing in the cobra's hole. Go ahead, Jack, continue. The calf and the lion and the yearling together, and a little child will lead them. The cow will feed with the bear. Their young will lie down together, and the lion will eat straw like an ox. The infant will play near the hole of the cobra, and the young child put his hand into the viper's nest. They will neither harm nor destroy on my holy mountain, for the earth will be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. In that day, the root of Jesse will stand as a banner for the peoples. The nations will rally to him, and his place of rest will be glorious." In that day, the Lord will reach out his hand a second time to reclaim the remnant that is left of his people from Assyria, from Lower Egypt, from Upper Egypt, from Cush, from Elam, from Babylonia, from Hamath, and from the islands of the sea. Thanks, Jack. Now, so, of course, some call it instead of the Lord, they, they, they identify the root of Jesse. But effectively, what they're arguing is that none of this is happening. I don't see this anywhere. Uh, so how can Jesus have fulfilled prophecy when this is a, a clear prophecy about the Messiah and it happens, hasn't happened yet? And, and we see also, we don't see the earth full of knowledge of the Lord. Let's take a look at Micah 4, 2, and 3, Jack. Many nations will come and say, Come, let us go to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob. He will teach us his ways, so that we may walk in his paths. The law will go out from Zion, the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. He will judge between many peoples and will settle disputes for strong nations far and wide. They will beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not take up sword against nation, nor will they train for war anymore. So what his argument is, we don't see the, we don't see the earth full of knowledge. And, and, and these are clear prophecies about the Messiah. And, and Micah tells us about a universal peace. And the argument is that hasn't occurred yet. 
And if Jesus is the Messiah, why not world peace? And according to Bernus, these conditions are why most Jews are still waiting for the Messiah. And what do you think about that? What's your what would your response to that be? Go ahead. The first Peter three. Uh, let me see where I am here. For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all these things are continuing as they were in the creation, from the beginning of creation. For the delivery will overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth swore out of water. And then we go to my spot here. Uh, scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing following their own sinful desires. This is the, the current people of the earth saying, hey, everything's been the same since you've been prophesying this. And it hasn't happened, therefore we don't believe. And the reason this hasn't happened yet is millennial. Well, what else? And that's true, bad burn. Yeah, I would answer a Jew on that by saying your own rabbis for hundreds and hundreds of years puzzled over the problem of two messiahs, mm -hmm. which is resolved in the fact that Jesus, the Messiah, comes as the sacrifice for our sin and then will come again as he promised as the one who will do all these things. You know, and you the whole idea of the second coming. And, and yet that's been in our verbiage for a long time. Now, they're also looking, what kind of a Messiah are they looking for? Conquering. A conquering Messiah. But but guess what? The disciples, the early disciples did the same thing. And, and I think it's important to recognize that. Uh, Acts 1, 4 through 7, Jack. On one occasion, while he was eating with them, he gave them this command. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water. But in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority. Now, that's one of the reasons why I'm focusing on Jesus in this series on prophecy, effectively. I mean, in it's about Jesus. The whole Bible uh, is pretty much about Jesus. So we're going to see clearly who Jesus was and what he did. And, and I did a little research on the topic. What would you say, and let me just ask you this question. What would you say if somebody prophesied about life in the future? And it would speak about a person's birth, a person's death, and many other details. In fact, what if I made over 100 specific prophecies about a person. But what I said wouldn't happen soon. In fact, it would happen some 700 to as many as a thousand years later. Now, con consider this. I'd be prophesying things with great detail and accuracy, and they wouldn't happen till 3023. What do you think about that? What's your response to that? I mean, it would if it happened, it would clearly be miraculous. But what you, what would you think of me if I was going around telling all these things? This is what's going to happen. What would you think? <laughs> well, since I know you, I would think that it was highly possible you were prophesying, but it would depend on it. You know, relationship and credibility of the person. And, and that's exactly right. The relationship, the credibility of the person. But here's more importantly, do you think there are people who prophesy things that aren't happening? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. I would want to know if you had prophesied anything that did come true. <laughs> that's no. <right. laughs> I wouldn't believe it. That's exactly what King David did, what Daniel did, what Micah did, what Isaiah did, and, and many others did regarding Jesus. So I want to go there. Specifically, I want to look at the likelihood of all of this happening in the way that it happened. Let me ask you, what do you think the odds are of Jesus just fulfilling, let's say, eight prophecies? What do you think the odds are? Specific prophecies. Well, actually, the odds are one 
or actually 10 to the 17th power. Okay, now look at all those zeros behind that one. And that's one in a hundred quadrillion. Okay, yeah, it's past trillion. I think after trillion comes quadrillion, but effectively it's a lot more than I can, I can't count that far. I don't know how long it'd take me to count that little bit. <laughs> but depending on the source, there are nearly 300 references and 61 specific prophecies of the Messiah fulfilled by Jesus Christ. Now, 61 is a very low number because I've seen uh, many more than that. Uh, but but Peter Stoner uh, and Robert Newman wrote a book in, entitled Science Speaks. And the book was based on the science and probability of Jesus fulfilling these prophecies. The book was reviewed by Les Krantz, and in paraphrasing the Stoner article, he said this. He said, Stoner claims uh, that many, that many silver dollars, okay, 10 to the 17th power, would be enough to cover the face of the entire state of Texas. Two feet deep. Now, has anybody driven the state of Texas from one end to the other? How long does that take you? That's a long, that's a big state. I've been to Texas. I've driven for days to get across Texas. Texas is a very big state. Who in his right mind would suppose that a blindfolded man heading out of Dallas by foot in any direction would be able to, on his very first attempt, he'd be able to pick up one specifically marked silver dollar out of 10 to the 17th power. One in 100 quadrillion. Now, let, let's look at it in another way. Consider these probabilities from Pastor um, uh, James George. And, and I think this is interesting. Um, now, there's some questions related to this, by the way. Do, do we count only direct messianic prophecies? So that speaks to the differences in, in the numbers, because they go all, all the way from um, 61 prophecies he fulfilled to over 500. So these are some questions that people ask. But, but let me show you the next one. Um, being struck by lightning. I thought I put this uh, slide in, but I didn't. Being struck by lightning in a year is one in 700,000, okay? So likelihood of any of us being struck by lightning is not high, right? Would you agree with that? Being killed by lightning is one in two million. Becoming president, thankfully, it's one in 10 million. <laughs> a, meteor, a meteor landing on your house is one in 180 trillion. So the likelihood of getting bombed by meteorites is not high. So, so you'll be killed by lightning, become president, or have a meteor hit your house is not going to happen. Now consider this. Eidersheim. Do you know, anybody know who Eidersheim is? Have you heard of Eidersheim? Um, uh, of course, he's Jewish, but he's also... Go ahead, Mari. So he's a, an incredible scholar. He's written about Jerusalem, the temple, and so on. And so it's well respected. As a matter of fact, I've got a book of Irish time that's like a bazillion pages. Um, uh, that's an exaggeration, by the way. But uh, he says that there are 456 specific Old Testament prophecies about Jesus, the Messiah, being fulfilled. And J. Barton Payne found 574. Needless to say, there's a lot of difference. These are the questions that differentiate between them. But other scholars... Um, have agreed that there are at least 300 prophecies that Jesus fulfilled. So the, the difference in these numbers comes from deciding which prophecies count, okay? Do we count only direct messianic prophecies? Do we count repeated prophecies twice? Do we count prophecies on Christ's ministry? Do we count types or prophetic symbols? So that's why they can agree on totally about 300 prophecies. Now, with all that said, with all that said, can you imagine the odds of just one person fulfilling not eight, because that's 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 one to the or ten to the seventeenth power, not eight, but three hundred? What is the likelihood of that? 
The odds of that happening are insurmountable, and yet Jesus did exactly that. And further, the evidence that the prophecies are not only precise, but the, but the evidence is that they are supernatural. Can you not see the supernatural evidence here? I mean, I, I mean, the odds of that happening is it just is it, it, it's it's impossible, and that's why um, anybody ever heard of Richard Halverson? Richard Halverson, who was he, Jack? I don't remember, but he came and spoke to my Bible college, and he was great. Well, he was a, he was a he was a U.S. he was a U.S. chaplain um, for many years. And here's what he said about it. Jack, can you read that? The real problem with Jesus Christ is not that folk can't believe in him, but that they, they won't believe in him. How many people have you ever talked to who will not believe in Jesus? Just don't make any difference what you said. Amari, you talked to some? My neighbor in Naples, she's dying of a fatal lung disease, can barely get her breath, and she will not... <clears throat> does not want to hear about it. Yeah. Well, don't for trying. I have tried. I keep trying. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Caroline, <laughs> our daughter, she's, you know, she just will not believe anymore. And when she's gone to a rural college, she's not going to believe. And so we, we pray and, and she'll tell you, well, Dad, that happens for you because, you know, I don't, I've got 10 mental illnesses. Well, Maybe if you accept Jesus, he'll take care of that for you. <laughs> she won't listen. Yeah, probably. Yeah, I have a soon. I have a Jewish friend, uh, well, Jewish friends, Lee and Sheila, and we've talked to them over and over about Jesus. I know you have. I heard you talk to them. And I think it was all uh, night. Yeah, he, he said he promises. His dad asked him to promise him that he would not leave the Jewish faith. And we gave talk to him about that. Well, you wouldn't be leaving the Jewish faith. Jesus is a Jew. Amen. Amen. But to add on to that, when we've been in the pool talking physically mm -hmm. to them, and we mentioned Jesus, it's like, you know, talk about Jesus. We can see in the spirit that yeah. veil. Yeah. Yeah. It's right. just like we didn't even say anything to them. It's just a spiritual Veil. They yeah. can't be pierced by me. Mark, I'm not sure that's the question. The question is, why won't they believe it? Is a better question. Oh, so you don't like my question? You got a better one? Yeah. <laughs> that's a difficult thing to answer because everybody's different. Yeah, right. Uh, it's simple to answer. You talk into a court. They haven't been quickened by the Spirit and given the faith to understand. Amen. Well, amen. The young man was the son of a man anti Christian. And Terry's uh, obedience, persistence, ad nauseum. <laughs> they accepted the Lord on their deathbeds because oh. Terry would not take no for an answer. Awesome. Period. Amen. Awesome. Yeah. I have two college roommates that I had not seen until two or three weeks ago. I don't see them often. Uh, both were involved in Campus Crusade, went to different places, worked for that after college. Both went to seminary, and they both announced to me that they no longer believe, and they really didn't want to discuss it. I was absolutely flabbergasted, and I didn't know where to begin. Yeah. Wow. And, and you know, the, the, the question that Marvin asked of why is almost irrelevant. Um, the, the important thing is to approach people with the truth and continue to pray for people, because I think... It is a spiritual battle. We struggle not against flesh and blood, but against darkness. And, and and effectively, you can see that all around you. So how do you break through that darkness? Number one, it begins with what? Prayer. Absolutely. Prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Yeah, Linda. Here. Oh, here. That's okay. What are you giving up for you? <laughs> oh, really? I, I think I'm going to be too much. Um. We had a lot of unsolicited phone calls on our landline, and so I just decided that if they're calling me, I'll just take that opportunity to try to talk to them about these. Join 
they are going to start offering. I don't know Jesus. I don't want to know Jesus. I hate Jesus. You are an idiot. And you hung up on me. So. You know, the Indian survives in the good place of the we had someone had told me one time that you can talk about God and people are, are okay. Yeah. But you talk about Jesus and it bothers them. And we had a neighbor and I was talking to him and I said something about Jesus and he started doing this little shuffle. You know, it really made him nervous. And so I thought that is true. We I could talk about God, but I couldn't talk about Jesus. Yeah, that's right. Because there's power in the name of Jesus. Well, one of the things that's very important is that uh, people I, and I'll add to this. People are lazy about investigating the most important issue in life, where they're going to spend eternity. And Solomon warned against this kind of laziness in Proverbs 6. Jack, can you read that? Go to the ant, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. How long will you lie there, you sluggard? When will you get up from your sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. Essentially, I think the, 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 the crisis of faith is a direct result of people being busy, not concerned, and involved in lots of other things. I don't want to talk about God. I'll put that over here in a box. And the reality is that life continues to continue, and they wind up being old and saying, no, you know, I thought about that. I'm not going to worry about it. And it scares me for some of those people, and it should scare you. And we need to continue to pray for people and pray for God to give us that breakthrough. How many people have prayed for years and seen God break through all of a sudden and, and bring people to himself? How many people have seen that? See, so, so you should be encouraged to continue to pray. I, I want to take a minute and look at the appearances of Christ in the Old Testament, which are different than the prophecies I said earlier. And I'm saying that because um, the many Old Testament prophecies are actual, also, appearances of Christ. They're not prophecies, but they're appearances of Christ. And if you think about it, that's pretty amazing. Okay, Christ in the Old Testament appearing? How many people believe that Christ is? I mean, here you have the Messiah who will come to earth in the future, who was prophesied about, and he's appearing to some people. And sometimes the very people who will be talking about his coming. Think about that. Yeah. And unbeknownst to them, what's, what's that, Marvin? Yeah. Yeah. I can't hear you. It's a the alphany. The alphany, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Using them big words, right? They got that from the seminary, I'll bet you. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a quote by Al Mohler, too, so you'll like that. But but under normal circumstances, think about that. That would be surreal. You're prophesying about someone who's coming in the future, and he's there with you? He appears to you? I mean, I mean, I that, that's kind of surreal, but more accurately, accurately, it's supernatural, is it not? So now, now wait, by the way, when you talk about the supernatural, you talk about things like heaven. You talk about things like spiritual warfare. Um, sometimes people, even Christians or uh, acclaimed Christians, are uncomfortable with that. Why is that? John, I, I think people try to straddle the fence between appeasing people of science and everything else. And so you you will dismiss things from the Bible, the supernatural is an example, for the sake of trying to have harmony with a world that has to has to have things proven to them via science. Yeah, absolutely. Gigi? I think a lot of us put God in a box, and if it's outside that box, we're like, no, that can't happen. But you know, how can you put God in a box? It doesn't work that way. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead, Deborah. Just to say that... Um, I had shared a, an incidence where I had heard the Holy Spirit a audible voice. And I used to work at Central State, and hearing voices is not a normal thing. <laughs> say something or not, you know, you're a little afraid, you're going to be seen as the person. So mm -hmm. I think that's what it's yeah. yeah. I think people don't want to be labeled a fanatic. You know, they say, well, if I believe in that, you're going to say I'm a religious fanatic, and I don't want to go there. 
You know what? The older I get, the more I don't care about being a fanatic. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I wish I was more of a fanatic earlier, Jack. That's the whole thing. We're worried about what somebody's going to think about us. And when I gave that up, it was the most liberating thing I ever. I didn't think anybody liked me, you know, and most don't. But it's it's so liberating, and that's what I tell people in my kids and everybody else in my ministries. If you worry about anybody except what Jesus Christ thinks about you, then you're in big trouble. Because a lot of kids that I grew up with, we were in ministry together as teenagers, went off to college, one of them to Wheaton, by the way, and turned their back on Christ and lived their whole life without Christ. And I said, what are you guys doing? Yeah. You know, when they got back with me. And, and it's, they got to college and they couldn't stand for somebody to label them as a as a fanatic, as she said, or some religious person it's a mind body and they give them eternity for that garbage mm -hmm. excuse me preacher this is one of the things really is yeah. well i'm telling you Jack, i've been in higher education for many years and i was considered a a, a right wing ideologue uh, uh and you can you can play with that all over the place but the fact of the matter is i didn't mind being classified that way i kind of liked it you know Lynn, right now the two colleges are being uh heavily investigated by the Justice Department, Grand Canyon University, oh. uh, uh, Christian College, and Liberty. And why is that? Because, because they're, they're Christian. Uh, Grand Canyon University has been fined $37 million. Oh, right. Just in the poll of all these crazy Yales and Harvard. Yeah, and that's right. We're attacked in a way that we have never imagined. I didn't know we'd be preaching today, but the, isn't that true? And all God's people said, yeah. Bobby. Yeah, um, the buyers that I actually worked for him, Marty Hans. Uh, we talked to him about Christ one night, and he was a uh, strong Catholic, went to Mass every week. And uh, right before he died, uh, he looked at me and said, I used to think you were a Jesus freak, and now I'm one. Amen. And he was a hard case, and uh, and his wife was harder. Uh, but but uh, Bobby and Sue, you guys were persistent with him, and that's awesome. Jay, well, back to your comment about the Old Testament and Jesus. I mean, he's been with us since the first from the he's the beginning and the end. I mean, he he's been there all along. Uh, so I don't know what we're talking about about him now. Okay, if you listen, you'll learn. I'm talking about is not him being the beginning and the end. I'm talking about him in personal appearances to people like Abraham in particular. But there are several other appearances where he actually appeared. No man has seen God. God is God is spirit. Jesus is God in the flesh, and he appeared in the flesh in the Old Testament. That makes sense? Everybody know, understand that? Yeah. There was a guy named Pat Morley who wrote the book, Man in the Mirror, and <laughs> talked about two types of Christians. The ones who call themselves Christians are cultural Christians, and then those who do practice Christianity are, are called biblical Christians. How many biblical Christians in there? <laughs> um, I was just looking at a video of this little girl, eight-year-old girl, who <clears throat> God has anointed with um, the ability to paint things. Oh. And she said, um, she said that she was sitting on her bed. She was eight. She's she's grown now, but she was sitting on her bed, and Jesus came into the room. She said he was sitting there. And um, it was her birthday, and um, he said, all he said to her was, ask. And she said, I thought about it. And this is this little eight-year-old girl talking. She said, I thought about it, and I thought, he's probably asking what I want for my birthday. And so I asked that my mom would be healed because she had a bad disease. And he, he said, done. And then he was gone. And her mom was totally healed from her disease. Amen. And, 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 and there are some, even in the Christian community, you say, oh, you know, you were just dreaming. That was That's coincidental. Uh, and we try and talk that away. Jack, I can go on for a long time about higher education. And uh, 
because I'm I'm with you on that. But in Marvin, this is a theophany, uh, so you use the right term, and it comes from the Greek word theo, which means what? It means what? God. Yeah, theo means God, and theano means to appear. So appearance of God. Um, 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 there's a there's a guy I used to work with, Dr. Jim Borland at at Liberty, who calls them not theophanies but Christophanies, because that's exactly what happened. That's exactly who it was. It was Christ appeared to people. Uh, uh, let me let me show you this one, Jack. Can you read this? This is this is Jim Borland. Those unsought, intermittent, and temporary uh, visible and audible manifestations of God the Son in human form by which God communicated something to certain conscious human beings on earth prior to the birth of Jesus Christ. So, Jay, that's what I'm talking about. We're talking about actual physical appearances before before people in the Old Testament. Uh, and that's a little bit different than Jesus being obviously the Alpha and the Omega, uh, but it's physical appearances. Um, and Dr. Borland's an interesting guy. He was a very quiet, real humble guy, but he was a and he continues to be a great scholar. Uh, so he's very bright and capable. Well, let, what I want to look at, uh, kind of the, the two of them, because it says no man has seen God. Uh, and so what I want to take a look at is uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament. So let's take a look first at uh, Exodus uh, thirty-three twenty. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no one may see me and live. Okay, and now, now let's talk about uh, John one eighteen. No one has ever seen God, but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. Okay, so no one has seen God, but tell me about that. Someone has seen Jesus. Yeah. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You've seen the Father. Yeah. So, so effectively, and, and I've read that there are 10 appearances in the Old Testament of Jesus, actual physical appearances, but I've seen as many as 70, which seems more accurate. And the Hebrew word now here for angel <clears throat> appears 214 times in Scripture, and literally it means messenger, okay? And it refers to different kinds of angels or different messengers. I like this angel. Don't you like him? He looks like a warrior, right? Yeah. And, and that's what I think of as, as angels. And there are a, a different kinds of angels, by the way. Uh, do you believe that? Uh, one of these days I'll get into speaking about angels. But 214 times in Scripture that, that word malak, M-A-L-A-K, is used. And it refers to different kinds of angels or messengers, depending upon the context. Now, for example, Genesis 16, 7 through 13, can you read that? Malak here is more than just an everyday angel. Okay. The, the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur, and he said, Hagar, servant of Sarai, where have you come from, and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarai, she answered. The angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will so increase your descendants that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now with child and you will have a son. You shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard of your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man. His hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him. And he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. She gave this name to the Lord who spoke uh, to her. You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. The God who sees me. That's Jehovah Jireh, is it? Jehovah Jireh? What's, what's the God who sees me? Um, is he, is he, okay. Well, how do you know that this is more than just an everyday angel? How do you know? They had power to increase her descendants. That's a lot of power. 
And, and, and you read the scripture, there are certain things that, that come that pop out. Number one, he asks the same kinds of questions that God asked in the garden. Number two, he gives Hagar orders without attributing them to God. Isaiah, if you look, Isaiah will say, God says. This angel doesn't do that. He also prophesied about her pregnancy before she knew she was pregnant. And, and God is, of course, omniscient. And he tells her what kind of man her son's going to be. Okay? And he tells her he will live in hostility with all his brothers. And she calls him the God who sees. Now, let, let me just say something here. If this was not God, he would have stopped her when she said that. And yet he said nothing. So, I, I mean, there's plenty of evidence that these appearances occur, and some of these appearances are not angels. They're Jesus Christ. Yeah, Barbara. It was distinguished with the words of the Lord, angel of the Lord. Not angel from the Lord. <laughs> angel of the Lord. Of the Lord. So, so there are what we call theophanies or Christophanies that occur all throughout the Old Testament. Now, that's just one example, but it shows that Jesus was active and present in the Old Testament. Now, uh, here's something that Adrian Rogers said. He walked in the garden with Adam and Eve. Don't you love this? He and two angels visited Abraham in Genesis 18, 1 and 2. Can you read that, Jack? The Lord appeared to Abraham near the great trees of Mamre while he was sitting at the entrance to his tent in the heat of the day. Abraham looked up and saw three men standing nearby. When he saw them, he hurried from the entrance of his tent to meet them and bowed low to the ground. And then what happened when Abraham took Isaac to be sacrificed? What did God do? Stopped him. He stayed his hand. And, and he said, I've seen God face to face and my life is preserved. He appeared to Moses in the burning bush. He appeared to Moses in the burning bush. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine coming up on God, Jesus? So, so there are lots of different examples of, of Christ appearing. And, and Moses and, and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu, and 70 elders, what did they do? Jack, read it. Exodus 24, 9 through 11. Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of sapphire, clear as the sky itself. But God did not raise his hand against these leaders of the Israelites. They saw God, and they ate and drank. So whatever the number is that Jesus appeared and made his presence known, we don't know exactly. But in fact, Jesus is the main topic of Scripture, and it's important for us to remember that. And we will see that throughout our current series. And, and again, we're talking about the Old Testament prophecy fulfilled by Jesus. And our intent here will be to cover the prophets by looking that way. Now, to that end, I'm going to begin with the story of Jesus. And I say that because the entire Bible is the story of Jesus, is it not? And the New Testament Gospels, in, in, in them, that story is told more than once. It's told how many times? How many times is that story told, at least in the Gospels? Well, it's told four times. Okay, four times. And three of them are very similar. As a matter of fact, that's why they're called, what are they called, the similar ones? Synoptic Gospels, okay? And, and they include many of the same stories. About 90%, for example, of what's in Matthew uh, is in Mark. And about 50% of what's in Matthew is in Luke. And also Matthew is for a Jew Jewish audience. Mark is from a, for a Roman audience. And Luke is for a Gentile audience. So there's a wide range of purposes that each of those were written for. But I want to take a look at uh, some of the emphasis of each gospel. The gospel of Matthew is very Jewish, as I said. And, and, and Jesus is presented as the promised Messiah. The promised Messiah. As a matter of fact, a lot of the language in, in Matthew is Jewish in nature. 
Jesus is the one who rose out of Israel and sat on David's throne. Isaiah 9, 7, Jack. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing it, uh, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So Jesus is the Jewish Messiah, and that's how he's presented. Mark tells us about the suffering Savior, and he was promised in Isaiah 53, but particularly in Isaiah 53, 4 through 7. Jack, can you read that? Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows, yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led, to, uh, he was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Some of the people that we were talking about earlier are, I can see them in here, like sheep who've gone astray, and each has turned to his own way. And you have friends like that. You have family like that. You have people in your lives like that that just are nice people, but they go their own way. They want to do their own thing. They don't want to talk about Jesus. Luke presents Jesus as the Son of Man, which comes from the Old Testament, particularly in Daniel's prophecies. Daniel saw a vision. Do you remember this? Daniel saw a vision, and in it, he saw one like the Son of Man. Daniel 7, 13, 14. In my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. And finally, John presents Jesus as the Son of God. And right from the beginning, John tells us who Jesus is. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. All things were created through him. Without him, nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. The darkness could not comprehend him. There was a man who came from God whose name was John. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness to the light. You see that right up front, what he's doing. He's telling us who Jesus was. He was God. He was sent from God. And in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. See, he was in the beginning with God, and then John tells us in John 10, 30, this is Jesus. Go ahead. I and the Father are one. Jesus is talking. So people say, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Anybody ever heard that? And yet I take him right to John 10, 30. What is this? This is Jesus talking. I and the Father are one. Now, now, I told you all of this kind of as a backdrop for our study on Jesus' prophecy. And, and, and what's important to understand is that how the promised one fulfilled prophecy to show us, went to the cross to save us, rose from the grave to ensure us, and went to heaven to prepare a place for us. Is that not awesome? So I want to get into, for the remaining time that we have, the story of Jesus and how, as he fulfills prophecy in the New Testament. Turn your Bibles to Matthew 1. And it begins with the genealogy in the first 17 verses. So why are genealogies so important, particularly for Jews? And there are at least five reasons, okay? First, it proved a person's identity as a Jew. What did Paul say about himself as a Jew? He said he was a Jew of Jews, meaning that both his parents were Jewish. And if they could prove that they were a Jew, they'd be, partake they'd be partakers 
of the blessings of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. And you'd also be among the people chosen by God as his people. And they were very tribal. And by the way, Jesus was tribal too. And if people weren't Jewish, they really couldn't participate as a citizen. They couldn't be a citizen. They couldn't participate in the synagogue. And they couldn't participate in Jewish life. So that was important. Secondly, family history was important. It determined where somebody lived. Why do I say that? Why did family history determine where you live? Places to live assigned to the tribes. Places given by God to the various tribes. And there were 12 tribes. Okay? And each of the tribes received land. Now, let me just tell you, and Mari, you can relate this. I'm part Irish. And that means somewhere in my roots, as an ancestor came from Ireland. And that was my maternal grandmother came to the United States from Ireland when she was 14 years old and worked as a maid. And her name was Conway. Her last name was Conway. And she came from Cora Clare, which is in County Clare. So it's a small, uh, basically farming village, and it's in southern uh, Ireland. Now, our family history is easily traced back at least a, a thousand years or more. And amazingly, our family home has been there for many, many, many generations. Now, does anyone besides Mari understand what it means to be southern from Southern Ireland instead of Northern Ireland? Anybody understand that? Yeah. Northern Ireland received a lot of the Scots immigration, so they they weren't as pure in blood. Yeah, uh, um, that's not. I mean, that may be true, but that's not necessarily what what I'm getting at. Is it the, the Catholic Protestant yeah. conference? Yeah, Northern Protestant, Southern Ireland is Catholic. Right. So my family was very Catholic. Yeah. Now, now Jews were similar. Okay? Their tribe also determined their land. And also, in addition to their land, their culture, their inheritance from God. And claiming land in a specific area required proof that someone was a descendant of that tribe, okay? Now, my cousin went to Ireland trying to find her family home, and she told him, they asked her name, she, she told him her married name. They didn't know anything about it, but when she mentioned her family name, Conway, they quickly helped her and took her to the property, okay? Mari, is that common? It's fantastic. Uh, I took him back to Ireland many years ago, and, you know, I would hear all the people whispering, that's Maura Hayes' daughter. <laughs> My mom's maiden name, you know. But, yeah, the buildings are still there. He saw the family home, little different facade. But uh, nothing has changed. It's just down the road from where you were, your grandmother was from. So, yeah, I'm from Ogunalo. You blink and, you know, you're through it. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's wonderful uh, country and great people. Great people. I, I have a friend of mine who's here uh, this weekend, uh, uh, Therese Byrne. And uh, uh, yeah, uh, so you, you know Therese, you've met Therese. When, when the Irish get together, uh, one of the things we did in Chicago is to ask where your family's from. Uh, because there were many in my neighborhood, many first generation uh, Irish. But uh, the Irish are also very tribal. Uh, very much so. So third, genealogies were proof that Jewish, particularly Jewish males, could serve in the Levitical priesthood. Priests could only be from the tribe of Levi and descendants of Aaron, the brother of Moses. Now, if he couldn't prove this connection, then he couldn't be a priest. And it also showed that the extent to which the Jews not only were Jews, but listen to what Paul said in Philippians 3, 4 through 6. Though I myself have reasons for such confidence, if anyone else thinks he has reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I have more circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. All right, so well, all of a sudden, what's, what's he done? He's identified his tribe. Who else was from the tribe of, Gen uh, of Benjamin, by the way? Saul. Saul. Yeah, King Saul. 
Go ahead, Jack. Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law, a Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. So I'm from the tribe of the king is what he's saying, okay, even though he was a uh, kind of a <laughs> useless king. But that's where he's from, so he knows, and he's a Hebrew of Hebrew, meaning both of his parents were Jewish. So, so Paul is legitimately a Jew, and he's identifying that, and, and he was a Hebrew of Hebrews. Fourth, the family's history could also show an affiliation with people of significance. For example, is anyone in here related to somebody famous? Anybody in here? Okay, you're related to on my mother's side, Daniel Boone. We're descendants of uh, Christian Brothers Choir. There, there you go. There you go. Well, well what's interesting is the Jewish version of that would be having Moses or Gideon as relatives. There, there was a special uh, co connection with those folks, and if you're related to them, then then you had a you had more prominence in the community, and and that was thought to bring blessings too to the person or to the family that was related to them. Now, let me give you an example. Okay, my name is Moisson. We're Irish, but we're also French. Okay, let me go beyond the synoptic gospels. Okay, now Moisson, the meaning of Moisson is Breton from the old French oblique case um, of a personal name. And Moisha is French from Moses. So now we're also in the wine country, so you figure that out. But but uh, this is from the Dictionary of, of, of American Family Names. Now, who knows? But when my son did 23 and Me, he found a segment of his... Um, Heritage being Jewish, uh, which is interesting. So anyway, who knows? But it's, it's kind of cool to be able to do How many people have done Ancestry.com or anything like that? Yeah. Now people have collected your DNA and they're going to use it against you. But, but, but Matthew and Luke both record Jesus' genealogy, but, but they're also a little bit different. Why is that? Well, Matthew traces the genealogy from Jesus to Abraham. And Luke traces it from Jesus to Adam. So are they different? Well, yes. But they actually trace two different genealogies. So I want to look at it real quickly, and we'll close with this. Um, some different verses. Matthew 1.16, Jack. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Okay, now go to Luke 3.31. The son of Malia, the son of Me. Uh, Mena, the son of Mattatha, the son of Nathan, the son of David. Okay, one of the things that people, Matthew traces again through David's uh, son Solomon and Luke through David's son Nathan. And critics pose these differences as examples of errors or inconsistencies in the Bible. Anybody ever heard that? Inconsistencies in the genealogy? And to Jews, genealogies were very important. And so they were kind of meticulous record keepers. And there are many theories here, but the most popular theory is that Luke records Mary's genealogy and Matthew records Joseph's genealogy. That makes sense? The more likely is that Matthew isn't trying to give a definitive chronology. So then why trace it through Solomon and not Nathan? Well, again, Matthew traced the royal and not the biological line. And again, he wants us to know that Jesus is who? The Messiah, the promised one, the king's son. And he reminds us that Jesus is the son of David, who is the son of Abraham. 
And again, this Jewish connection, this Jewish audience would have known that the Messiah was to come from David. Now, what's the tribe of the Messiah? Where did the Messiah come from? What tribe? Judah. He is not only from Judah, he is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay? Jack, read Genesis 49.10, will you? The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until he comes to whom it belongs, and the obedience of the nation is his. Now, if you take a look at this here, um, this is Judah right here. Now, by the way, this is the promised land that God provided for them. Israel is right here, and it's not very big. But guess what? It's going to get bigger. Okay? Do you believe that? Yeah. As a matter of fact, I'm wondering if if the whole thing that's in Gaza, the, they gave that land away, uh, and I think they're going to take it back. That's my opinion. So it's fun to see this happen. But here is Judah, and 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 Jerusalem actually, uh, in according to this map, is partly in um, uh, Benjamin's territory, but it's partly also in Judah's territory. So we see that this is the tribe of Judah. And so when Jesus identified himself as being from Judah, this would be part of his land. This would be part of his heritage. Uh, and, and effectively, how often did this go back to the families that it was originally given to? Every How often? Every 50. Every 50 years. Because the 50th year is called the what? The Jubilee. Okay, so... Um, What's interesting about this also is that number 14 is important. So we've got the, the, the lion of the tribe of Judah, but we also have the number 14th along with the Hebrew concept of what I'll call gematria. Jack, can you can you share that? Matthew 1, 17. Thus, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. Now, I found something interesting in an article. Uh, can you read that, Jack? Although Jacob was old and dying with eyes of faith, he saw through the mist to a day when the tribe of Judah would take leadership in Israel. The people of Judah would be lion-like in courage and strength. Their tribe would lead the way the other 11 tribes would follow. The scepter, that is the sign of legal authority, would rest with Judah until Shiloh comes. Shiloh is either a proper name for the Messiah, or it is a Hebrew contraction, meaning he to whom it, the scepter, belongs. If it is a proper name, then Shiloh means the one who brings peace. And, and finally, I, I read this from Ray Leisure. And, and, uh, and by the way, just because I said finally didn't mean that I meant completely. So, Jack, can you read this? Another point worth noting is the significance of the number 14 and the Hebrew concept of gematria. Gematria was the practice of ascribing numerical number, a numerical number, to a Hebrew letter. The first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, alf, was the number value for, uh, of one and so on. Interestingly, the numerical value of David is 14. Isn't that interesting? One more, and, and it's covered in Deuteronomy. I won't go there. Deuteronomy 25, 5 through 10. But, but it, it, it says, basically says that if a man dies without a male heir, the brother of that man then marries his wife and performs conjugal duties. So Jacob, Joseph's father and Matthew, died before producing a male heir. Therefore, Heli a close relative that's in the genealogy as well, married Jacob's widow and produces Joseph. Now, if that's the case, then Joseph is the legal son of Jacob and the biological son of Heli. Accordingly, Matthew covers Jacob's line backwards uh, to Abraham, while Luke traces Heli back to Adam. So most scholars believe that the differences are explained by a combination of these last two I covered. Now, I tell you that because many Bible critics will argue these things. So we're going to dive more deeply into this next week. Uh, but for now, um, 
Let's pray.